SJC 12932, Commonwealth v. Braulio Caliz. May it please the court, my name is Molly Ryan Strehorn and I represent Braulio Caliz. Thank you so much for taking an interest in this case. Mr. Caliz comes before this court seeking credit for 717 days he previously served on a drug lab conviction that has been vacated. Mr. I'm going to unfortunately get you back to that, that hypothetical, which you tried to forget on your ride to your uh, new office. It was uh, like, yeah, so, give, me, give me time to think. Oh, awesome. All right. So, so I, I, I think I've had a better chance to refine my hypothetical because I'm, I'm not trying to be cute. I'm just trying to see where we are with him because the standard in homes of equally compelling circumstances is, is unclear. So I just want to try to flesh that out. So we have defendant. A, who was convicted of a drug offense. Um, he then goes, uh, he serves about a year. He goes to court, appeals it. And this court says, no, the drugs are suppressed and his conviction should be vacated. We have defendant B, your client, who was convicted of a drug offense, uh, happens to be a Farrakh case. And then this court in Farrakh says, all the convictions are vacated. Um, in the meantime, he picks up a new case and is, is, is serving a sentence. Um, under uh, our case law, defendant A would not have the benefit, correct, of, of jail credit? Correct. All right. And, and so what's different about his case than um, defendant B or your client's case? So the, the way it's set up right now with this standard for equally compelling circumstances, uh, it asks courts to look at the reason why the conviction was vacated. And so in this case, we have egregious government misconduct. And th though you've had years and years to think about what that really means, the, the government is responsible for this conviction that had to be vacated based on their conduct. The, the, the government's responsible for the uh, motion to suppress, right? When they, when the police illegally seize the drugs, and 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 we say no, you 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 needed a warrant to go into the house. You couldn't just barged in. The government, it, there's governmental misconduct in both circumstances, uh, and we've never defined equally compelling circumstances. I guess which is what, what, what we're going to be called upon to do. So. In, in, in Dukin, we, we didn't say that. Um, and I think there's the appeals court that case that says says that bond. So why is Farrakh different from a motion to suppress that's allowed because the police illegally enter a house or the Dukin case? Well, interestingly, with the equally compelling circumstances, we set up a comparison for why the convictions were vacated. But in this circumstance, we also look at when they were vacated. And as, as you, you know, during the long protracted litigation that involved all different players to figure out what happened, the Attorney General's office withheld information that would have been valuable to defendants like Braulio Caliz. So it's not just an issue of why the conviction was vacated, but when. And when defendants had access to this type of information, and the difference between the Dukin defendants and the Frock defendants in this particular issue of timing and when is that when, when Dukin happened, we set up the drug lab courts. Within seven months of Dukin's resignation, the number one priority was looking for defendants who were currently serving time with Dukin certificates. Nothing like that happened in the Frock cases. In the alternative, people were left with their convictions to, to serve out the entirety of them while the attorney general's office put up roadblocks to those defendants having access. So it's also an issue of timing. That's on the onus. That's a very fair observation. Um, let me ask you, um, the equally compelling has to be equally compelling to actual innocence, right? That's the equally part of it? Well, that's, that's kind of what Holmes left open as a question. Um, okay. And so far, there's just been this search for, for defining what that means. And we come before the court questioning what that is now, 
um, and really asking the court to evaluate the, the standard and the follow up. And let, I'm sorry, I have one more question. Um, let me ask you um, a question I should probably know the answer to, but I don't. Um, with respect to this jail credit issue, and then the second case where you seek to apply the credits to, does there have to be any continuity of, uh, of jail custody in between the cases, or could there be t a two-year gap and they pick up the second case and then we apply the jail credits if we agree with you to a Farak, essentially banking, to a crime that occurs a year, two years, three years later. Um, so what's the temporal part of that, if you know? Well, interestingly, um, when, when Holmes was in the appeals court, um, they, they discussed this question and, and it wasn't necessarily a question of continuous custody, but a question of when the first conviction was vacated in relationship to the second conviction. So uh, as, as in the, Mr. Khalees' circumstances, he was already serving time on the second conviction right. when he found out that the first one was and, and that's why it's more compelling because it's continuous. It, it, there's not that huge gap where they bank in, in, in your case. But, but, that, but that's not a requirement in your view. No, Your Honor, no. Um, and as, as you can see in the amicus brief that Magdal added to this discussion of whether or not bank time is actually a legal fiction, um, as you can see, there's no evidence that, that it adds to people's behavior to think that they're going to go out and encourage criminality based on this fallacy of having time in the bank. Well, this well, is that, well a, we haven't... Experimented with that, have we? This, this is going to be a bigger chance for that, right? Where <laughs> Justice Gaziano may know how many um, defendants got the benefit of the, our Barack decision, but it's, it's in the tens of thousands, correct? Correct. So yeah. Under your view, we're going to have tens of thousands of people um, who may have been. Um, who were not released, in, at least until our decision came out, um, uh, with significant amount of bank time, right? Uh, so essentially, uh, you know, this huge group of people who were accused of drug crimes are going to have a giant amount of bank time um, if we adopt your view, right? Well, my view relating just to Mr. Khalees. Well, we can't look at just Mr. Khalees. And actually, Mr. Khalees has less bank time because he actually was serving concurrent time for, for another totally unrelated drug offense. Um, so we do a pretty significant subtraction for Mr. Khalees, don't we? The 717 days takes away the 545 days that he had concurrent time. Can I, was, can I, yeah, can I push you on a couple of other points then? So. Um, our decision treated the was more generous to Farrakh defendants than Dukum defendants, right? Because of that more egregious conduct you pointed out, right? We gave the benefit not just to people who Farrakh tested, but any la any all the people in the lab, right? Yes, I think part of your decision was based on what would have looked like if the Attorney General's office had conducted an investigation. And no, I, I, I get it, but we were we gave that sort of plus benefit in I the think Brock you, you, cases. Well, right? you, you, you recognize that the misconduct extended beyond Sonia Farrakh's name on a certificate. She was tampering with other uh, lab workers. But also, didn't we take into account the fact that the AG did not respond appropriately in terms of the breadth of the remedy to, or am I misremembering? No, I think, I think it's a combination of the misconduct of the Attorney General's office in putting up roadblocks, committing a fraud upon the court, being disingenuous on the evidence that they had and not fully investigating the misconduct of Sonia Farrakh. So I, I believe the way your decision was crafted in CPCS versus the Attorney General's office was to take into account what it would have looked like if the attorney general's office had actually done the investigation. 
right? So and it also penalize but, them for their misconduct and failure right. to do these. See, that's my point is that you're saying that we should give credit in addition to all these things because Farrakh is worse, because what because the AG's behavior is worse and led to longer time. But we did take that into account in terms of extending the, the type of offenses covered. And now you're asking us to extend it to a whole nother category, which are totally unrelated convictions where giving credits and totally unrelated convictions. Let me give you another analogy. So 258D, where we allow compensation, we still require, you know, something approximating proof of innocence there, don't we? You do, and um, also had a decision where um, insufficient evidence could lead to an actual innocence but we're, when we're talking about monetary compensation, I, I think it's, we have to differentiate that as, as a way to make someone whole versus having their, their lives have meaning and credit for time that they were incarcerated on a conviction that has been vacated. As so we should, we should be, why wouldn't we be doing this? Why, I mean, we have a higher level of proof there. It, that's something that is, closer to you know the, the standard rule there the standard is 258d is on grounds resting upon facts and circumstances probative of the proposition that the claimant did not commit the crime is, is that a better standard for us to is that a you know if we're going to give credit sh should we be looking at something like that for credit too well, I think it, it, it goes back to um, the standard of actual innocence and what is an equally compelling circumstance to actual innocence. I, I think we also have to differentiate between making someone whole by giving them monetary compensation and making someone whole by recognizing that you can't just change a docket when these have been actual days that people have been incarcerated and separated from their families. But, but counsel, we can't we can't give those days back now. Um, they're they're gone days no matter what. Even if you give somebody credit, it's still uh, gone. Um, my uh, what I'm ha struggling with is if we is where we draw the line, and if say for example, um, your client or uh, gets two years for hypothetically bank time, and then five years from now commits a rape. Is that credit going to apply there? Well, the, the question is the difference between mandatory and discretionary credit. And where in this case, I'm seeking mandatory credit on his sentence right now. Um, as you can see in the MACDL brief, they suggest another alternative, which is to give judges discretion to take that into account in future sentencing. And so, if, if that was happening during sentencing and this, this court allowed that type of discretion, then the, the, the trial judge or the sentencing judge would be able to take that into account. So we still have to give them standards. Um, and your standard is whenever there's a Farrakh type of misbehavior, there should be credit. So those 20,000 defendants we're talking about, if one of them goes out and rapes somebody, wouldn't, wouldn't they be entitled to that credit under your view? Well, at this juncture in time, you would have, a, they would be aware of the time that they had a vacated conviction, which is different than Mr. Cully's. So Mr. Cully's entered the sentence, began the sentence before the conviction was vacated. So in that situation, I mean, unless you adopt a judicial discretion model, then the timing wouldn't be a factor to allow for jail credit. Would, would, it, would it just be governmental misconduct on the scale of Farrakh that we're talking about on, on your equally compelling circumstance? Well, I'm, I'm really hoping that this was a very unique situation that we 
don't have to replicate in the future. But if we're imagining another world where there's egregious government misconduct. That's, that's, what, that's what we thought after Dukin. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think this court over you know, the last eight years has crafted some extraordinary remedies to allow people to have access to justice in cases like this. And I believe the court will continue to fashion such remedies. Um, but hopefully this is, this is a situation that we won't face again, but it, it not only is warranted for people who have suffered this type of harm, that they shouldn't be the people who are penalized. And secondly, maybe it will be another disincentive for the type of conduct that we have here, if there are these very significant types of consequences. You, you've rebounded very well, Ms. Strayhorn. <laughs> you have to. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, Thanks for your interest. Attorney Wendell. Yes, uh, good morning and may it please the court, Assistant District Attorney John Wendell for the Commonwealth. Uh, I would like to, if I may, point out uh, one thing about Holmes, and that's there is no rule in Holmes about equally compelling circumstances allowing uh, jail credit. That's an open question in Holmes, and I would submit to this court that there is actually a very good policy justification for saying, no, there is no basis in which we would ever give jail credit uh, where the sentence has been completed and the um, new charge is committed after the individual is released from incarceration. Fundamentally, granting jail credit in this type of circumstance, it undermines the basis of incarceration. Uh, the basis of incarceration, there are uh, if I recall correctly, there are generally four uh, factors involved in sentencing ideas, uh, punitive, rehabilitative, public safety, and deterrent. If we grant this kind of relief any time after the fact, we're not properly punishing the individual for the act that they committed, that, because we're saying, oh, you did this you served this time prior, we'll count that as if it was punishment. It's very clearly not punishment. It also it undermines the deterrent factor, uh, totally undermines the public safety factor. The, the plea judge concluded that the defendant, based upon his conduct, needed to be locked away for a period not less than and not more than seven years to get him out of the public, to get him away from law-abiding citizens. So I would suggest there are justifications to answer the open question of Holmes with a no. Simply say, we do not allow this even for actual innocence, even for circumstances equally compelling to actual innocence because the policy justifications just aren't there. Uh, but more specifically to this case, we don't actually fix a problem in this case. I just want to test, I'd like to test that a little bit, Mr. Wendell. So so you've got somebody who's actually innocent, and I'm not suggesting there's any evidence that these, this defendant's actually innocent, um, but you have someone who's actually innocent, who's served you know, time that he shouldn't have, just the total, and the prosecution knows he's been, he knows they got the wrong guy, and they sat around and did nothing about it, um, and, while that's going on, he, he does commit a different offense. We shouldn't lower his, shouldn't lower his current situation sentence by, the, I mean, he's in jail, so we're getting the deterrent basis that you're worried about. We still shouldn't lower that person's, give that person a credit either, even though he served time for something he never did. Um, and then he commits a new crime. Let's even say it's the same crime. Shouldn't that we shouldn't lower that one? So actual innocence doesn't get you any time off. I'm not sure I understand your hypothetical, Your Honor. Is the defendant still incarcerated at the time that he? The uh, defendant, defendant, defendant commits the first crime. He's totally innocent of. He, he, he goes and does his time for that. He spends two years in jail. Um, gets out, commits a new crime gets four years in jail and he still has, you know, three years left on that sentence. Shouldn't give him any credit for the time that he was in jail for the, you know, 
for no reason whatsoever. I would submit we should not. It, it is a tragedy, but this is not the fix. We, we, we do not fix the problem by saying, oh, well, we'll consider that time prior. All we do is put him into jail the second time for an so improperly so short so amount of time. So 258D is the solution. For, you get compensated for your, the, that wrongful conviction. You get, that's the solution. And this, we should wipe out this whole concept of... Um, yes. Okay. That, that would be my position, even if you, but even if you allow that there might be credit in that kind of circumstance, even if you allow there might be credit in circumstances equally compelling to actual innocence, this is still not one of those circumstances. This is still not equally compelling. And there is no basis uh, in the nature of the Farak situation itself to grant a special Farak exception. This seems like, it seems like we, we've decided we can compensate you for that time in jail, um, which really isn't the approximation of a time in jail, but credit actually is the approximation of a time in jail. Uh, so it, in certain ways, it seems like you could actually give what you were you could actually equate what you lost much better, um, but you don't like that. Um, instead, you'd rather the Commonwealth, you know, pay out millions of dollars and things like that. You know, that's that's your your preference. Well, that that's also this court's preference, as per Holmes, uh, that we cannot allow the banking of time. And this situation, though it does not directly implicate that, comes too close to implicating that. It. Simply, it does not work uh, to allow uh, the banking of time to ever be done because of the potential problems down the road. Uh, and so that's just, that is a rule that this court has said. I leave uh, this court's language in Holmes as to why that's a terrible policy idea uh, as my defense of why we should not allow this as a general rule. As for whether we should have an exception, I would suggest that the uh, Farrakh situation is not one which warrants an exception. Uh, on the subject of what precisely happened as a result of the Assistant Attorney General's misconduct in this case, the answer is the defendant obtained a dismissal where he probably would not have otherwise had one. Uh, I'm reading now from CPCS versus AG, noting that Dukin's misconduct was not accompanied by misconduct by a prosecutor or an investigator, we ultimately determined that the stronger deterrent of dismissal with prejudice was not required. Accordingly, we established the Bridgman II protocol to allow efficient case-by-case -case adjudication of the remaining cases affected by Dukin's misconduct. Essentially, that's page 725. Essentially, had there been no misconduct by the AAGs, we would not have dismissed these cases. Uh, and under the Bridgman II protocol, the defendant would have lost this old case, the 2012 case. And whenever, assuming there had been no misconduct by the assistant attorneys general, the defendant probably could not have obtained relief. He certainly could not have obtained relief via a Ferrara Scott motion in 2012, 2013, 2014. It's simply not possible based upon the requirements of Ferrara Scott because Farrakh's misconduct is not attributable to the government in a case where she is not the chemist. In this case, the chemist was Rebecca Ponce. That information uh, is in the appendix. I might we, already, we, already, the appendix. we already went further than that though. We've, we've wiped out the Pon Ponte's type convictions be to punish the the extent of governmental misconduct here, right? We've already gone further than you just said. Y yes, Your Honor, you absolutely have. Uh, my point is that the, the, the reason that the defendant 
wishes this court to come up with an exception to the Holmes rule is because the government interfered with the defendant's ability to seek relief from his incarceration in 2012, 2013, 2014. And that is simply untrue because the only method of seeking relief in 2012 to 2014 would have been via a Ferrara Scott type of motion in fact, such a motion would not have existed until this court adopted it in 2014 uh, with uh, Scott itself. And it's simply not possible to meet the first prong of the Ferrara Scott test in the defendant's circumstances because there is no misconduct which predated the defendant's plea and is attributable to the government because Farrakh's misconduct insofar as she tampered with other chemist samples is not attributable to the government because she is not an agent of the prosecution team in those cases. So the defendant could not have obtained a new trial under Ferrara Scott in 2013, 2014. It's simply not possible. So by the time uh, this misconduct became an issue, the uh, Assistant Attorney General's misconduct became an issue which could have entitled the defendant to relief, he had already been released. By the time it became a live issue, uh, he was at liberty. His sentence on the 2012 case had been entirely served. So we're fundamentally dealing with a situation where it's no different than Dukin. And uh, the defendant does not ask the court to overrule Bond. So we're, we're left with Bond, which says that egregious misconduct, um, or rather the presumption of egregious misconduct, because there is no proof one way or the other, uh, but egregious misconduct by a government official is not a compelling circumstance equal to actual innocence. And therefore, the Holmes exception, if there is one, doesn't apply. Uh, so, and... I will note there's no particular reason to make a special Farrakh related exception to this. A year ago, I was before this court on another matter and Justice Gaziano asked me, how do you undo the damage? Forget the specific language, how do you undo the damage? The answer here is we can't undo the damage for multiple thousands of people unless we just deem this a everyone who gets um, everyone who had a conviction with incarceration based upon one of these cases gets that credit against any future of, uh, offense. And that, for the reasons articulated in Holmes, is a terrible idea. And as was noted in Holmes, it only benefits the recidivists, those who commit new offenses after the fact. There are still going to be, I would suggest, thousands, if not tens of thousands of people who have committed no offenses since uh, the uh, original Farrakh case for which they were incarcerated. None of them will get the relief of credit for their uh, dead time, despite the fact that every single one of them has it. It's so they can uh, pursue a 250, 258D. Precisely. Right? They can do it, but these guys who were in there, this may provide an alt you know, another option. The recidivist, the recidivist point um, that Justice Granger is troubled by. You could give a recidivist, instead of treating them better, you'd treat them sort of equally in the sense they'd have another option. But that fun fundamentally, Your Honor, that doesn't treat them equally because if the reason why we do this, despite the policy reasons against, is because it's not possible to properly compensate for time that has been spent that is dead time, then no amount of compensation given to those non-recidivists will ever equal the granting of credit for the dead time uh, as, was, uh, as would be given to this defendant and the others in his very particular situation. So we're left fundamentally with recidivists being treated better. They get the actual equivalent as opposed to the monetary not quite equivalent that the non-recidivists get. So the only people who benefit from this kind of exception are the recidivists, and it's not actually a proper equal alternative. Um, if I may, I would like uh, briefly to address the amicus brief. Uh, 
the amicus brief, uh, well, largely the amicus brief should be ignored. It makes requests that have, makes arguments that have been made by neither party um, asking that Holmes be overruled. Uh, but I, even though that should be ignored as per Finch versus Health Insurance Connector, uh, that's 459 Mass 655, uh, and Commonwealth versus Dustin, that's 476 Mass 1003, uh, the amicus points out an interesting fact about Holmes. Holmes is actually an exception and is not the general rule. The general rule is discretion where there are circumstances. All of the cases cited in the amicus brief, Lewis, Shalafu, Brown, Grant, Gardner, Manning, they all allow the continued uh, exercise of judicial discretion in granting the credit for dead time in appropriate circumstances. Holmes and uh, Milton with it simply say that where the sentence is completed, the defendant is at liberty for a period of time, and then the defendant commits a new offense. It is not appropriate, regardless of when the defendant learns that he has dead time, it is not appropriate to give him dead time for that completely unrelated uh, situation. So the argument by the amicus that Holmes in some way undercuts judicial discretion, it doesn't except to state that there are public policy reasons why we do not do this one very particular thing. Uh, and so I would suggest that the amicus simply misunderstands Holmes in asking for its uh, being overruled. But, but as I say, as neither party suggested that, uh, that argument should be rejected anyway. I see my time is up. If there are no further questions, I'd rest on my brief. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor.